Breaking It Down with Frank McKay. This is 1039 LI News Radio. I'd like to welcome everyone to Breaking It Down. Our very special guest is Michael Gray. Michael is a, a former actor. Uh, you, you probably know him in the world of pop culture uh, as as Billy, who played uh, Billy on Shazam. And I know comic book fans all over the place uh, know this man. How are you, Michael? I'm fine, Frank. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm great. Are you, am I correct in calling you a former actor? Uh, that's correct. I'm a former actor. You're not, you're not acting any longer. I, I'm not acting any longer, and I haven't even considered it up until lately, but because of the um, resurgence and the popularity of Shazam, I've been getting offers from down in L.A. Um, Warner Brothers re-released the DVD, and all this uh, revival has got me curious. So I have a good life right now. I'm not acting, but I'm considering it only because I'm getting offers. Now, what creates a resurgence in pop culture situations such as Shazam or, or for that matter, uh, any of that. Do you think the Big Bang Theory has anything to do with that? Well, let me, let me go back to the 70s when I was doing the show, and I, I didn't realize, I didn't have an ego, so I didn't really realize how popular the show was or how popular I was. And what had happened with Shazam, as opposed to other Saturday morning shows, is because I was in all those teenage magazines. I had a series back in the early 70s called The Little People with Brian Keith and Shelley Fabre. And because of that, I was on the front cover of most teen magazines for about six years. And what had happened now, because the demographics of Saturday morning TV, normally from 5 to 11, now the demographics were 5 to 20. So the show became so popular over that matter because of the age viewing of the viewing audience. And those people now, they're in their 50s, are getting wind of the fact that the show has been uh, revamped and put on DVD, and they're buying it. So Comic-Con invited me down to do an appearance down there, and then I went to the Paley Center in Beverly Hills. So this came out of left field. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a nice thing. That's a nice situation. Now, uh, Michael, uh, you and your wife run a, fa- uh, a florist? That was that's actually ancient history. If you go on IMDb, if you go on a lot of stuff uh, websites uh, on the internet, the flower shop we closed that up um, about eight years ago. We okay, that was a while ago. Beverly Hills. Yeah. And like for example, Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne were our neighbors. We became good friends with them. But we catered to all the celebrities, and it got to the point where we were working seven days a week, sixteen hours a day, and the flower shop was running us. We weren't running it. So we closed it up, moved up to Carmel. So we live up in Carmel, California now. We're not doing the flower shop anymore. That's Clint, East, uh, Clint Eastwood's uh, area, right? Yeah, I have. Uh, I rub shoulders with some pretty cool neighbors. <laughs> yeah, he was the former mayor of Carmel. Am I right? He was. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, do you know him well? I don't. I've met him a couple of times. I certainly don't know him well. He um, he owns a lot up here, including Mission Ranch, which is a very cool hotel restaurant and. Occasionally he goes in there and plays piano, which blows people away. He just walks in, sits down at the piano bar, and starts to play. So, wow. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's certainly a, a tourist attraction, I imagine. No question about it. So now let's, let's talk about uh, pre-Shazam. What did you do prior to that? Were you a, a child actor? Well, I grew up in, um, in Miami Beach, Florida. And what had happened... Uh, for some reason, somebody saw a picture of me somewhere. I really don't know where it came from, and they wanted to know if I'd be interested in acting, and I said, nah, it doesn't interest me at all. So, but an agent called me and said, we want you to do something. We, we want you to do an ad for Boulevard Watch. It's going to be in Life magazine, or Look magazine, one of the two, which is way back in the 60s. And I did it. And uh, from that, people started taking notice, who's this kid? And they started checking me out, and they wanted to know if I wanted to study acting, and I still said no. And then I thought about it, you know what, maybe I'll do this. So I went to New York, and I interviewed at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and I went out to California, and I interviewed at Pasadena Playhouse. And I was accepted at both, and I said, I, I like this. I like acting. It's fun. I like creating other characters. So I went to Pasadena Playhouse for three years, studied there, 
And that's where it all began, really. This was 1965, and an agent saw me in a play with Leanne Ames and Lorraine Tuttle and Ben Murphy, and she signed me to a contract, and she sent me out to 20th Century Fox for a series called Room 222. Sure. Which I was signed to and got a seven-year contract, and I thought, boy, this is easy. And then I learned the word nepotism, and I had, we shot the pilot, I had the part, and the next thing I know, somebody's friend who knew a friend whose son wanted to be an actor, and they put him in my part, and then I didn't have the series any longer. Which, so, which part were you up for? I was playing the part of Bernie. Oh, okay. That's a big, that's a big role there. It was fun. I, my first interview, I, my first series, but then again, I learned nepotism, so that... Uh, that was Car- Karen Valentine, pilot. right? Karen Valentine, Michael Constantine, yeah. Yeah. Now, what did you do after that? How did you take the disappointment of that? Um, I took it well. I just kept going at interviews, and it seems like everything I went on, I got. Mostly were small parts. Uh, the next thing I did after that that really generated interest was, and this was the beginning of my so-called teenage idol syndrome, is I did a movie of the week with Burt Reynolds, and I played his brother in it. And it was an Aaron Spelling production. And What was uh, the name of that movie? It was called Run, Simon, Run. It was a movie of the week. Okay. And the kids saw it and started writing into Tiger Beat magazine, wanting to know if they could run pictures of me. And Tiger Beat ran a postage stamp size photograph. And the kids saw that and started writing in, and the thing started growing and growing. Next thing you know, they were doing articles on me, and I was on the front cover. And um, Warner Brothers owned Independent News, which was publishing... Tiger Beat and all these other magazines that this one production company had, and they decided to put me into a series called The Little People with Brian Keith and Shelley Fabray. I remember that. Wow. I remember that. Way back. Let me just remind people who they're listening to. Michael Gray is is here. He's a former uh, former actor, and, and certainly people in the pop culture world know Michael's work, and uh, certainly the resurgence of, of Shazam. And the TV show, uh, Michael played Billy in Shazam, which is uh, what's the lead role. So uh, let, let's go back to that, what you were just saying. Well, the, the teenage idol syndrome was, was interesting, and I, I really didn't know what I was getting into. How old were you at this point? I was um, 25, I believe. Uh, 20, yeah, tw- I, I looked 15. Well, I was going to say, that's a nice thing to do in in Hollywood. I mean, Ralph Macchio had that same thing going for him, right? Exactly. So I was on the cover with those guys, David Cassidy, Bobby Sherman, Donny Osmond, and Michael Jackson. I ended up meeting most of those guys as well when we had photo shoots at the magazines. And because of the popularity of of Shazam, of Little People, excuse me, and the the Teenage Idol Syndrome, um, it sort of generated a lot of interest in me, and then Brian Keith changed the format of the show, and I was off the show, including a few other people, and then uh, I immediately got a phone call from the Brady Bunch to do an episode of that, which I did, and then that started snowballing, and then Shazam called me, the people from Shazam, and I ended up uh, signing a contract to do that, so that was the beginning of... I had a lot of small parts in between as well, like the Flying Nun and Marcus Wilby and things like that. But Which episode, uh, Michael, did you do on the Brady Bunch? It was called Marsha Gets Creamed. Uh, I it, played Jeff, her boyfriend in it, and I went to the ice cream parlor and with a date to make her jealous. And oh, and she, she got hit in, in, in the nose with the football. That was she hit me with whipped cream, actually, in the, in the ice cream parlor. Ah, okay. Right. That wasn't the uh, Something Suddenly Came Up episode? No. No, this is okay. called Marsha Gets Creamed. Oh, all right. That's she creamed me with, uh, with uh, whipped cream, basically. <laughs> now, hey, now, what does that do for your recognition? You're, if you're on a Brady Bunch, you're on an episode of the Brady Bunch, and all of a sudden, uh, I, I'm sure everybody, especially when it hits syndication, everybody knows who you are at that point. Everybody sees you. Even if they don't know your name, they see your face, and they, they've seen those episodes a million times. What does that do for you? I get more notoriety out of that than from the little people, to be honest with you. Shazam and, and, and Brady Bunch, is, uh, I, I get more recognition factor from those two shows. And I did one episode, which is absolutely insane. But that show was so popular. Now, the little people, you know, that had a cult following, but it really never, it, it, well, yeah, it certainly never you know, got to the ranks of the, the Brady Bunch in popu- as, as far as popularity goes. But, I mean, the little people uh, had sort of its own cult 
uh, following. Have have you done a lot of these shows, a lot of these uh, Comic Cons, and and you know those different types of shows? I had a lot of offers to do them over the past maybe eight or nine years, and I just kept saying no because when I was doing Shazam, every weekend I would go to a different city to do a personal appearance every weekend, and it got to the point where I was on the road more than I was home. So we would do. Uh, like auto show conventions. I was working with Dick Clark and John Travolta, the guys from Welcome Back, Cotter. We're all over the country doing this personal appearances, Adam West, Burt Ward. And I was doing literally that every single weekend. And I got tired of it. And when I started getting asked to do Comic-Con a while ago, I said, I don't want to do that again. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's very draining. I would wake up in cities. I didn't know where I was. I had to pick up the phone and call the operator of the hotel and see which city I was in. And... Just about two years ago now, I decided to do Comic-Con because I was asked to do it again. And Warner Brothers at that point was a coincidence because they were getting ready to re-release or release the DVD, which people were asking for for a long time. They acquired the rights to it. So I was down there at the same time Warner's was, and I did a few seminars with them to promote the show. And I walked into this auditorium, which I didn't expect. There was about 1,500 people in there. And I walked in, and they were all giving me a standing ovation. Totally blew me away. I, I was not prepared for that. Mm. And then Paley Center called, because they were doing the thing with Warner Brothers as well, to promote the DVD. So I haven't done a lot of that stuff, but I'm getting more invitations to do it again. So that's why I'm considering possibly coming out of retirement. I don't know. Yeah, well, if you're just tuning in, Michael Gray, former actor who's considering coming out of retirement, <laughs> Uh, right here, right here on, on Breaking It Down, uh, Michael's talking about, uh, you know, reemerging. And, and I was going to ask you, I mean, my question was going to be, what's the downside of, of Comic-Con? But I guess, you know, you, you answer that by saying that there's a lot of, a lot of different cities and a lot of different, uh, you know, runarounds. And I'm not talking about Comic-Con, but, you know, the different cons and the different conventions around the area. Let me ask you this. How do they pay? Can you make a nice buck doing that? When I was doing the personal appearances when Shazam was on, yes. I actually made more money off of personal appearances than I did off the show because back then TV shows weren't paying a lot like they are now. Uh, what, what were they paying back then? And, you know, you don't have to be exact or whatever, but, I mean, give, give us an example. Could you make a nice living off of Shazam? No. The first, the first year, this is 1974 now, the first year we made $750 an episode, hmm. which might be a lot of money back then, but certainly not enough to live off of. How many episodes? First year we did, I think, seven episodes, and they reran each one five times. Little People, for example, we did 26 episodes. That's the way it was in the early 70s on Primetime Network. You did 26 episodes, and they reran each one one time, so it was 52 weeks. That was a year. And, and what did Saturday that pay? Morning TV was different. What did that pay? Was that better than uh, Shazam? It was better than Shazam, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you could make a nice living on that. And you were, you were of age, right? So you had your own money coming in. I did. Yes. How, how were you with your money? And, and you don't have to, again, you don't have to be specific if you don't want to be, but uh, a lot of young guys, you know, get a nice paycheck coming in and they're actors and they're musicians or rap stars or rock stars, uh, athletes, and they get a nice paycheck coming in and, you know, all of a sudden they figure out what to do with that, that free time and they, and, and they burn out a little bit. Did you run into any of that? No, I didn't. I, um, I came from an upper-middle-class family, so uh, I didn't get crazy. A lot of the people that do that are sort of nouveau riche, and, and they don't know what to do with the money, and they just buy things that they normally wouldn't buy. I was frugal, not cheap. Yeah. Frugal, I put my money away, invested it properly. Uh, ended up, you know, after the years, I bought a piece of property up here in Carmel and built a home on it, which was a great investment for me, which is my future, obviously. Are you still in the, are you still in the same home? Yeah, this was my vacation home for many, many years. See, I think that's I came fantastic. Up here, it's overlooking the ocean. I came up here to get away from L.A. I, I, that's terrific. I'll tell you, that's that's terrific. How far is Carmel from L.A. again? It's about a five-hour drive. Okay, so it's uh, midway through uh, L.A. Uh, to San Francisco, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's not a bad spot to be. That's a beautiful area. That's for sure. Michael Gray is our special guest, and he's uh, a former actor. And you've seen them on, on The Little People and Shazam and The Brady Bunch and all types of things like that. Uh, how about some other shows that you, you made some appearances on that, w that we might be not be covering here? Well, there, uh, 
everything I did really was a smaller part, uh, more cameos. I did, um, if you want to go way back, we're going to do The Flying Nun, Marcus Welby. Uh, I did a few movies, one with, um, it was called Myra Breckenridge with Farrah Fawcett, Rex Reed, uh, Mae West, and John Huston. What was Farrah uh, Fawcett like to work with? Did, it, did you work with her much? I was on the set with her. My scene was with uh, Mae West, actually, in that particular movie, but... How was, was she? I think How was Mae West? First movie. She was stunning. I was uh, walking like a puppy dog, following her around. She was drop dead gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, even at that age, right? She must have been sixty years old at the time, right? She was quite young. I think it was her first thing she did coming. No, out you're talking about years. Farrah Fawcett. I'm talking about May May West. Oh, May West. Yeah. May was a trip, man. I mean, she um, she came on the set at around one o'clock in the afternoon. A limousine would actually pull into the studio at the sound stage. And I, this huge driver would get out and basically help her out of the uh, out of the limo, walk her right into her dressing room. She'd come out about an hour later, and everybody was enamored. We're looking at Mae West. This is a legend. And she just sort of sat there, leaned up against a slant board until they, she had her scene, and she would do her scene, go back in the dressing room. She was amazing, amazing. I'm working with Mae West. It like blew me away. Was she personable? Uh, no, nobody got to get close to her. Oh, okay. She had a bodyguard that was the size of uh, Alex Karras, you know. Nobody even just got near her. <laughs> right. How about Alex Karras? Did you get to work with him? He lived in the building I lived in when I was living down in L.A. I lived in a, in a high-rise building. The less celebrities living in there, and he actually lived in the building. Now, you mentioned uh, The Flying Nun and Sally Field. Did you did you have a recurring role on that, or was it a one-time deal? It was a one one gig. Uh, it was a small part in the show. That was, uh, I think, the second season. I think I was on it. Were you a comic book fan growing up? I read Superman, uh, Beetle Bailey, things like that. Richie Rich. I like comics. Yeah, and from uh, day one, you were a comic guy, or were you kind of As a uh, child? Sure, I used to read them under my covers with a flashlight. My parents thought I was sleeping. Do you have any pressure on you? To, to say, and I don't mean to me, but do you, do you feel any pressure to overstate how much you like comics because you, you made such a, uh, you know, a, a notable name for yourself through a comic character? Do you feel uh, the need to, uh, I don't know, almost justify that? Because so many comic uh, book fans and and. You know the you know the nerds out there, and I say that respectfully. I was I like comic books, you know, growing up myself. But you know, so so many of them take it so seriously. And is there any kind of pressure on you? And you know, maybe some of the other people who represented those those uh, comic book characters to overstate how much you like comic books. Interesting you ask that, because I, I do get that question a lot, and I almost do feel like I am pressured to even fabricate and say that I liked them more than I did uh, when I got the part of, of, of Billy on Shazam. I didn't even audition. I was just called up, you want this part to be great? Would you like it, basically? And it was work, so I took it. And, and I just, from the time I got it, I started studying up on, on Shazam and Captain Marvel. I was not knowledgeable of the show at the time. Uh, yes, of course, I knew who Captain Marvel was from some of the comics, but people do expect me to say, oh, yeah, I was a huge fan, but a lot of Captain Marvel. I didn't. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's interesting. It's work. I mean, it's work. But you see that famous skit that they did on Saturday Night Live with, um, uh, with William Shatner, and he, you know, basically criticizes the, uh, the Trekkies for uh, for their questions, he tells them, you know, go get a life and everything else, and and you know, of course, at the end, he uh, he's at the end of the skit, he's told to uh, get out there, or, uh, or it's going to cost them money. Get out there and and apologize to the, to the people and make up something. And he made up something that they were. He, he was being the evil Captain Kirk, if you remember. You you know the skit. Say again. I said you know the skit. I, I I didn't see it. I heard about it. Yeah. Now I mean, this is the type of thing that Shatner got heat for, right? It's, a, it's the funniest skit you'd ever want to see. It. But he actually gets heat for it uh, within, the, uh, within the community, or he did originally. And I think people get it now, and I think people have a, 
uh, have more of a sense of humor about it. But at the same time, uh, people take their, their their comic book characters very seriously. Michael oh, yeah, Gray. Trekkies, big yeah. time, yeah. You, you know, don't mess those Trekkies. No. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, Michael Gray has been our very special guest. We have about two more minutes with Michael. And he is a uh, he's a wonderful actor, uh, a retired actor, and he's uh, thinking about coming back. Uh, basically, in, in the next minute uh, or two, if you can tell us uh, what is going on right now, I, I, the D- DVD is coming out of uh, Shazam, and uh, this could mean bucks for you, right? This could be a good thing for you. Yeah, there's, there's actually a couple things happening right now. One. Um I just actually, I've been writing a book for five years, too, and it was just accepted by a publisher. So the editors are going through it right now, and they're going to publish it. And that, uh, I'll talk about the DVD in the book real briefly, if possible. If you go on my website, michaelgraytv.com, I announce on there all my events and things I'm going to be doing. So if people check that out, the information on the book will be there probably within the next month or two, what time and when it's going to be out, and basically um, where to get it. As far as the DVD at Warner Brothers, uh, same thing. Go to my website or go to WarnerArchives.wb shop, and they have a three-disc version out there, of, totally revamped. Uh, they took it off of Betamax and put it on the DVD, so that's doing quite well. And you can go to Michael Gray, actually Michael Billy Bats and Gray on Facebook, and there's a lot of chatter going on with that as well. So the DVD and the book are the two things I'm working on right now. And give the spelling a gray. There's a couple ways to spell gray. G-R-A-Y. G-R-A-Y. Yes. A-Y. Okay. Michael Gray has been our very special guest. And go to his site. Give the site one more time, Michael. It's michaelgraytv.com. And that's where everything I do is, is, is uh, basically put up. And the Warner Brother DVD is warnerarchives.wbshop.com. Actor Michael Gray has been our very special guest for this segment. Michael, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frank.